I was originally going to start off this video with the statement, I like things that are different. I was going to talk about how contrarianism and a decade's worth of media consumption have resulted in a passionate interest towards authors and creators who dare to do something different with their work. I still think that the events of how I reached this conclusion are accurate, but what writing this script has taught me is that I don't enjoy things that are different as much as I dislike things that are generic. Those two statements do definitely play into one another, but for me, the latter is for sure stronger than the former. When you spend most of your time consuming literary media regardless of the medium, you begin to notice trends that overlap from work to work. Think about how many games feature a totally blank, brooding protagonist whose only redeeming quality is that they shoot things real good, or how much Japanese media centers around a young, totally not a secret chosen one protagonist on a quest to kill the demon lord, king of devils, evil overlord, god of death, king of demons, demon king. I'm not saying that either of these two examples are bad by the way, not at all. I enjoy a lot of media that falls in line with these two examples, and admittedly the tropes that I find generic will inevitably be based on the genres of media that I spend a lot of time with. The point that I'm trying to make here is that the media that I tend to appreciate the most are those who use pre-existing ideas such as these two to build new creative ideas on top of. This idea is what I think makes the topic of this video, 2024's Pacific Drive, so incredibly unique despite many of the concepts found within the game not being particularly original on their own. Pacific Drive is this strange chimera of genres that make it hard to pin down as being any one specific kind of game. The best way to describe its genre is that it's a survival slash exploration game mixed with a driving simulator and it also has aspects of roguelike gameplay in addition to kind of feeling like a horror game even though I imagine a lot of people won't find it particularly scary. If you want something to directly compare it to, I think Pacific Drive has a lot in common with Subnautica, another game that already has a lot of its own stuff going on when it comes to standing out in its genre. The comparison certainly isn't one-to-one -one with Pacific Drive in terms of ideas, but it's probably the closest you can get. The premise of this game is as follows. In the year 1941, a scientist named Ophelia Turner invented an experimental new technology known as LIM. The potential of this technology was so great that in 1955, the US government created a new military division known as ARDA to oversee LIM's development, with the HQ for the research of LIM being stationed in Washington State's Olympic Peninsula. Limb technology had dangerous and anomalous side effects that the people researching it did not fully understand, and a disastrous lab accident resulted in the area where the experiment had taken place being caked in mysterious and paranormal phenomena on top of anomalous creatures appearing. This effect continued to spread throughout the Olympic Peninsula, and after countless attempts at containing the spread failed, in 1987 Arda issued a mandatory evacuation order to all those within the area and constructed walls to prevent anybody else from entering. The walled area became known as the Olympic Exclusion Zone and was subsequently abandoned. Fast forward to the year this game actually takes place, 1998. You, the player character, are working a vague delivery job near the border wall and accidentally get transported into the zone. You find a crappy old station wagon that two men that still live in the zone use to contact you and guide you to safety, an auto shop formerly owned by the same woman that developed Lim in the first place which becomes your base of operations for the rest of the game. The three researchers, Tobias, Francis, and Dr. Turner, referred to primarily as Oppie, all agree to do their best to find you a way out of the zone, which will require you to drive this shitty shitty car you found deeper and deeper into the zone, all while trying not to be killed by the various spooky phenomena and dangerous anomalies spawned from it. You will collect resources, upgrade the functionality of your car, your equipment, and the auto shop to eventually uncover the details of what actually happened to cause the zone to deteriorate in the first place and find you a way back home. Pacific Drive is a game that I sincerely love. It's probably in contenders for being in my top 10 games of all time. That being said, this game has a couple of big flaws that will severely hamper many people's reception of the game that I'm going to be discussing. This is my first time doing a critique like this, and because of that there are a few things I'd like to say as a preface. I am not a designer or a professional of any kind, I'm just a person who has played quite a few video games in my time that has some opinions that I'd like to express. Please don't take anything that I say in this video as gospel, and please feel free to comment if you disagree with me or notice if I got something wrong. Now that I've covered my ass, I'm going to put up the spoiler warning. I'm going to be discussing everything that happens in this game right up to the credits. Please go play Pacific Drive if you haven't before watching this video, I think it's really great. Okay, let's get started. 
What we're going to do is take a quick glossary look at the gameplay loop to familiarize or refamiliarize ourselves with what playing Pacific Drive is actually like, and then take an individual look at all the elements that comprise the gameplay loop and talk about how those elements succeed or fail for me. And we're going to start from the point of the first excursion outside the garage. After fixing up your new car to the best of your abilities, Oppie instructs a player to install a machine she invented called the Arc Device into your passenger seat. This is a fantastic little device and one of my favorite parts of Pacific Drive, but I'll wait to talk about it until we actually need to use it. We also outfit our car with trunk storage space and a crafting mat which we can use to craft basic necessities on the go, and then Oppie teaches us about the route planner which we will use to plot out which parts of the zone we want to explore. The concentration of junctions that you will eventually be able to access on this map is very dense, but for now we need to build an antenna in order to be able to detect which junctions throughout the zone are able to be driven through. See, the land in the Olympic exclusion zone is constantly shifting and warping due to the effects of the instability. The layout of the land is constantly changing with certain areas being worse than others. This, in addition to meaning that you're on a set time limit within each junction before they are consumed by instability, means that you can't return to the garage by just turning back and going the way that you came. Ignoring that for now, we're sent to a perpetually stable junction in the zone to collect the parts we need for the antenna. The game teaches you here how to collect basic resources and crap tools. It also introduces you to the most common anomalies you will encounter within the zone. These are creatures, beings, or otherwise phenomena that will act as your main point of conflict through each junction. The first you're sure to encounter is the abductor, which will grab onto anything that passes underneath it and violently drag it underneath itself. You'll also meet a group of tourists here, which are harmless unless they are hit with a strong enough force, such as being hit with your car, at which point they explode. Once we collect all the parts for the antenna, we have to get back to the garage, but like I said, we can't get back the way we came. This is where the arc device comes in. Scattered around each junction is a set of what are called instability anchors. These keep the junction stable enough for you to travel through. When you're ready to head back from each run, what you need to do is collect these anchors and feed them to the arc device. Once you've collected enough of them, you will be able to use the arc device map to open a portal in the instability, this giant glowing pillar in the sky that you need to drive your car inside of. I love this feature, it's always exciting and never lost its novelty for me. Back at the garage now, the resources you collected now allow you to build the antenna. This is done through the Fabricator, which is a machine that uses the energy from the anchors you collect and turns them into blueprints that you can use to create new technology and upgrades for your car. I like this system, but I also think that it's the game's biggest problem. Much more on that later. Once the antenna is installed, you've cleared what I would consider this game's tutorial. We are given the choice of mapping out more parts of the zone or continuing with the main story, which involves just going to the junctions that are marked on the planner. Let's now circle back and start talking about each of these pieces of gameplay specifically, starting with the car. What separates Pacific Drive's take on the survival genre compared to any other is that you are not meant to ever fully overcome the challenges of the setting. The Olympic Exclusion Zone never stops posing a threat to the player, and a large part of that is due to the design of the car. Because the car is a piece of shit. By design. During your first couple of excursions, this car sucks at everything it tries to do. It barely gets any traction on paved roads, let alone on dirt or mud. The lights suck, and it handles like there's an elephant in the backseat. These are all problems that can eventually be fixed through fabricator upgrades, but even a fully upgraded car with Olympium doors and a limb-chipped engine will still get fucked over by the zone pretty regularly. The thing that you'll learn very quickly about Pacific Drive is that everything is temporary. Tools break, the upgrades break, god if the car breaks. I'm surprised that the equipment in the garage doesn't occasionally break down too. This design decision makes the gameplay of Pacific Drive very touch and go. You're constantly having to park, get out of your car, repair, get back in the car, and keep going. This isn't just healing a part's missing health though. Parts of your car can also gain conditions that require a craftable consumable to fix. Stuff like your tires coming loose requiring a mechanics kit or a fuel tank springing a leak requiring a sealing kit. Beyond this, continuing to use a certain car component for too long will likely end with the component gaining a permanent condition such as becoming fragile or rusty. This can become a death sentence to certain components, such as batteries beginning to constantly leak electricity, your tires can also go bald, and your shields and other pieces of technology can become unreliable and their defenses will become less effective. I feel that this system of component durability will be very polarizing for a lot of people. Though I personally like this system for how it kept me engaged and immersed in the game, I imagine there's another sect of people who thought that what I just explained sounds harrowing, and I understand that. Some people won't like having to constantly get out and seal a crack in a door or replace a spark plug. The fact that this is such a large part of the gameplay loop is going to turn a lot of people off of the game. 
Pacific Drive is already a game that I suspect takes a very specific kind of person to enjoy, but still, the implementation of this system makes me wonder if a better middle ground could have been achieved to make this system more palatable for people that won't like it. The game does give you a ton of options for how one can go about repairing their car, but the act is never exactly convenient. The simplest way is probably using the blowtorch or repair putty, but both of these are consumables that you will eventually need to recraft or replenish, and still require you to get out of the car to apply mid-run. A more interesting idea that the game has is giving you the ability to cull components off of abandoned cars in the zone through a tool called the Liberator. I can see how some people might prefer this idea, but I find that most of the car parts you find out in the zone are already going to be partially damaged, and the act of first liberating a door, bringing it over to my car, removing my existing door, and then replacing it with a door that doesn't have that much more health, even if my old door had a status condition, didn't sit right with me when I could just deal with the status condition for the run, and run the door through the matter deconstructor at the shop that would just give me the ability to craft a shiny new door. The only other consistent option you have for car repairs are upgrades for the shop. You get access to a machine called the Matter Regenerator quite early, which you can store car components in for it to repair over the course of a run. This machine works fine, but it has the same problem that the Liberator has for me, which is having to run around the shop fiddling with menus. It also bugged me that using this machine most efficiently meant crafting an entirely new set of car components so that I could always swap out my damaged parts with fresh ones. I didn't feel like doing that every run. Polar opposite of the matter regenerator is the repair station upgrade for the shop, which automatically performs repairs on your car every time you park it in the garage. This upgrade is one of the most useful in the game, and would be an essential upgrade if only it didn't become available so late into the game that it stops becoming worth it. This is a byproduct of a larger issue which I've already alluded to earlier, and we will get to it in due time. Something I found interesting while playing Pacific Drive was how good a job the game did at keeping me feeling like I was barely scraping my way through it. I constantly felt like I was treading on thin ice in my runs throughout the zone, and that one wrong move would spell my end. That being said, the difficulty in this game is rarely high enough to actually prevent you from finishing a run, let alone dying. I have done two playthroughs of Pacific Drive across a little under 50 hours, and I have died in this game a single time. That was on my most recent playthrough when I entered a dead-end junction without knowing what it meant. Apart from this, I was really surprised by how non-lethal the zone is even when the world is this hostile. Pacific Drive doesn't have direct, easy, or hard modes, but instead has a selection of options within the settings that you can tweak. However, the level of modification the player can make to the difficulty is pretty shallow in my opinion. The game's lack of difficulty is not just a problem of not being super punishing, but rather that the bigger issue is that the anomalies in Pacific Drive are not very threatening at all. I have more problems with how these creatures are handled aside from this, but I do think that this is their biggest problem and one of the biggest flaws with the game. Pacific Drive has 48 different anomalies that you can encounter within the zone, and one of the things that I really like about the game is that through the Fabricator, you can find a piece of technology that will counter or otherwise help in an encounter with just about any one of them. However, this system gets undermined when you discover the power that is driving the fuck around whatever is in your way. This approach to enemy encounters can work and even feel rewarding, but only if the punishment for being caught by an anomaly is hugely punishing, which in Pacific Drive it often isn't. It can feel like it, but the oft available option that is being able to get out and make repairs effectively gives you so many do-overs if you continue to fuck up that at a certain point it felt unfair. I can imagine a lot of other players travel with basic support items like repair putty, mechanics kits, and sealing kits at all times. And even if they don't at first, I feel that they will if they find themselves without something that they need even once. You can find the resources to craft these items fairly easily within the zone, sure, and I could drive around with a fucked up tire trying to locate these items, or I could just add a side storage compartment and keep a mechanics kit in there to fix my tire now. Storage space is something to be considered, but it never was a big enough issue to encourage me not to be prepared for stuff like this. Sorry, tangent over, back to what I was talking about. Many people are probably going to say that me not engaging with many anomalies was just a result of me playing the game very carefully, but I don't really think that this is the case. Many of these anomalies are very easy to spot from a safe distance away, and even if you're in a junction with heavy fog or pitch black darkness, most anomalies have some sort of identifying sound effect that you can use to know when one is nearby. Even disregarding that, I actually know for a fact that I don't play this game very carefully, and I know this because I run into wriggling wrecks constantly. These things were the bane of my fucking existence for the majority of both my playthroughs. These are anomalies that prey upon people who are driving too fast through the zone. They surround you in an electrified barrier and blow themselves up if you get too close. 
I actually really like how these anomalies are designed, but I still hate them because I get caught in them so damn much. These things only spawn in the outer zone, meaning that you encounter them quite often, and to memory, across two playthroughs, I've successfully spotted and avoided a wriggling wreck twice. I'm going to talk more about those things in just a second, but my point is, is that I don't think I'm playing this game very carefully at all, and that not interacting with anomalies being the most consistent way to counter them, and the game seeming to encourage this, is kind of boring. What I think many anomalies in this game needed is some sort of mechanic that made the player have to engage with them occasionally, whether it be something like one blocking your path through a junction exit, or them just straight up trying to come after you. There are anomalies in the game like this already, a good example is the bunnies. These are a variety of enemy that will travel alongside your car and eventually try to latch onto your vehicle to screw with it. These anomalies actively seek you out, being one of the only anomalies in the game that actually does so, and while they still aren't particularly difficult to deal with, the thing that I think makes them good is that they force you to decide how you're going to deal with them, with the game giving you a myriad of options to choose from. It's a shame that not even a tenth of the remaining anomalies share this level of interactivity. The only other one I can think of right now is the previously mentioned Wriggling Wreck. I don't mind as much that the counter to this anomaly is to drive around it, because being caught within it results in an electric shock, which is one of the few types of damage in Pacific Drive that you cannot fully prevent. You can lace your car with lead-plated doors and panels, but even then, you're only reducing the damage taken from this specific type of attack, which in the context of a full run will probably not be appealing to most people. These are the only two anomalies that I'd call very well designed. Most of the other anomalies don't share nearly as much consideration as these two. That leads me into another problem I have with some anomalies, that being that some of them feel like placeholders. When I talk about this, I'm mainly talking about a variety of anomalies that I refer to as spicy circles. These include the cough box, sizzling mist, hot mist, and devil grinder anomalies. All of these anomalies function the exact same, just being a small zone on the ground that deal a different kind of damage. These are the worst anomalies in the game in my opinion. They of course share that same issue of just being another anomaly that you drive around to counter it, but what bothers me more than that is that these things feel like an insult to the greater setting. The Olympic Peninsula, much like the SCP universe, is not bound to realism. In fact, the whole point of both their settings being that these anomalies are mysterious and do not play by the rules of the real world. There is limitless potential for what an anomaly could be in Pacific Drive, and yet one of the most common ones is just a spicy circle. Junctions in the game often have unmarked areas on the map where there is a small level of radiation, but those aren't ever even directly mentioned, let alone given anomaly status. But these things apparently do? I think that's really what bothers me, the fact that these are apparently worth anomaly status. There's a lot of padding and reuse of anomalies in general, and I could talk about and kind of tear into that, but what I need to remember is that Ironwood, the studio that made this game, is not a AAA developer and may not have had the resources or funding to make or flesh out as many of these. But still, some anomalies like the seven types of bunnies or the previously mentioned spicy circles really make me wonder how many of the game's 48 count of anomalies is truly original. But instead of being mean about that, I'm actually going to take a second and sing the praises of some of the game's better anomalies. Like the Fallen Firmament, which makes it rain giant pillars that spew radiation on impact. These are one of the few actually frightening anomalies. These only appear in the deep zone, and they feel very appropriately ridiculous for that area. The spike puddle straight up pops your tires if you drive over it, and the fact that it is so easily visible feels appropriate for that punishment. This feels like one of the very few appropriately tuned anomalies in terms of balance, not being that difficult to work around, but if you do find yourself getting caught in them, you can use the puncture-proof tires to make them not a problem anymore. Lastly, I think the addition of rare helper anomalies that are directly beneficial to the health of your car was a fantastic idea. Junctions sometimes have car stops in them that will charge or heal your car in them occasionally, and they always felt really out of place in my opinion, and these feel much more appropriate. I also didn't know that these things had been added during my second playthrough, and the experience of stumbling across one of these things for the first time was very memorable. Moving on from that, in my opinion, it'd be a sin to talk about this game and not mention its outstanding audio design. Audio isn't really my forte, and I don't want to look at it too critically, but I will say that I was consistently impressed with the sounds that play in and around the car and with the game's ambient noise. Special attention is given to properly portraying how things sound inside the car versus being on the outside. Your guide's voices seem to boom from the radio on the inside of your car, but leaving it will have them play through a headset of much worse quality. Hey, uh, uh, driver, I bet you're dying to hear all about the remnants by now. Can you not? I'm a little busy trying to keep them alive. 
I'll keep to the basics, I promise. They deserve to know what they're getting into. Fine. I'm giving you 60 seconds. That is not nearly enough time to get... 55 seconds and counting. When it was raining, the shift in its sound from hitting the ground to the roof of your car was also seriously impressive to me. And as mentioned previously, I like that each anomaly has its own unique identifying sounds. Okay, now back to the bad stuff. Man, it's hard to make a critique about a game without sounding like you hate it. I don't hate it. You're most critical of the stuff that you love the most and all that. I'm gonna move over and start talking about Pacific Drive's three largest flaws, quirks, the story, and progression. Those last two kind of feed off of each other, so I'm gonna start by talking about quirks. Quirks are a system in Pacific Drive that I think are meant to endear the player to their car while potentially affecting gameplay in minor ways. At some point during the game, your car will begin to act strangely. One of your doors might open when you shift the car to park, or the hood of your car will open when you move backwards, but close when you move forwards again. Most players will recognize that something weird is happening here, but it seems too specific and controlled to be a bug. It's not until you look at the tinker station in the garage that you'll learn what's actually going on. Your car has a quirk, and it will continue to have about half a dozen of them for the remainder of the game. I get where the idea for these comes from. Anybody who's spent a reasonable amount of time in an old car knows that each of them has that thing in real life, it's always something like one of the inside door handles being missing or rattling when you turn on the AC or something. When I was a kid, my dad drove me around in a blazer that had a compartment in the center console that you could keep coins in. He did keep coins in there at one point, but it eventually got so filled with dirt and filth that the coins became practically welded to the plastic, and neither of us were brave enough to try and excavate that 48 cents out of there. We sold that car with those coins still in there. Uh, anyway, notice how I didn't mention any cars where a back door opened if you went too slow or the car jolting forward whenever you turn the headlights on. That's what quirks in this game are like. This is another one of those issues that's going to be very polarizing to a lot of people because the details of each quirk are decided randomly. For as many extremely annoying and debilitating quirks that your car develops, there will be another handful that you don't even realize you have until you look at the tinker station. To fix a quirk, you first have to properly identify it in the tinker station. By default, you have a limited but fairly generous number of guesses to use until you either get it right, refunding the guess and giving you the option to fix the quirk, or until you use all your guesses and have to leave and return to the garage to get more. Quirks typically require a consumable to fix, but can also require basic resources. Fixing quirks is not the problem. The little identification minigame can be strangely fun, and the fabricator has numerous upgrades that can be made to make this process easier, including showing you which parts of your guess are correct, or even letting you spend anchor energy to reveal a part of the answer. The problem I have with quirks is that you're sometimes just suddenly burdened with an annoyance that you have no way to deal with until you get back to the garage. And this happens with quite some frequency, especially in the latter half of the game, I find. And I get that there isn't really a good time to develop one of these things, but seriously, sometimes you'll turn left out of the garage and realize something's fucky and have to turn around to fix it. I understand the idea, and honestly, I like it, but the implementation of the system currently doesn't endear me more to my car. In fact, at times, it makes me dread having to deal with it. Oh, and before you tell me in a comment, I know that you can turn them off. Like I said, I don't want the system removed, I just wish it was better. Off the back of that statement, I've written an outline for how I think this system could be made better. Like I said before, I'm not a designer, this is just what I would do if I was, for some reason, in charge of designing the quirk system. First things first, let's slow down the frequency in which you get these things by a lot. I'm talking like 8 throughout the whole game. And make them consistently noticeable so you aren't stuck with quirks that you don't even know you have. Let's also make it so that you can have like 2 quirks at a time, max, maybe 3, but that still feels like a lot to me right now, my opinion could change. Next, right now quirks are structured like if-then statements. If I toggle on my headlights, then one of my doors opens. My suggestion would be to slot in an AND between the two. For example, if I toggle my headlights, AND my windshield wipers are on, then one of my doors opens. 
I know that this sounds counterintuitive to what I just said, since a quirk being harder to diagnose will mean that you'll be stuck with it for longer, but here's the second part of this idea. Temporary fixes. Whenever I got a quirk that forced one of my doors open when I was driving, I would think about the excessive duct tape I had been collecting in the zone so far and thought about how cool it would be to be able to just force my door shut until I got back to the garage. And if I did have to open this door for some reason, maybe I would first have to remove the tape and reapply it when I was done. It's still a problem to be solved, but it makes it something that you can do alongside sealing a tire or otherwise repairing your car. You can poke holes in this idea, but I at least think it's a decent start to improving the system and would be better than something more drastic like removing quirks or making them purely cosmetic or something. Food for thought. Let's move on to the issue of the story. The story in Pacific Drive has got two main things going against it, those being that one, it's extremely short, and two, the ending is terrible. In my opinion, the story isn't that interesting either, but that's of course subjective. I certainly didn't think it was bad, but I was personally more entertained by the gameplay than the actual events of the plot. Let's go over that plot now. I'm not going to spend a ton of time going beat by beat here because only like four important things happen in this game that people who have played the game already know and people that haven't don't care about if you've gotten this far. Alright, here we go. Everything that happens in Pacific Drive is a result of an event that happened in 1961 called the Mass Hallucination Event. There existed an anomaly in the deep zone known as the Well that constantly produced large-scale gamma-ray bursts at random intervals. ARDA researchers Dr. Alan Turner, who is Oppie's husband, and Dr. James Kay were working on either finding a way to control these bursts or eliminating them entirely. They never found a way to stop it, but they did develop a technology called a remnant that allowed them to manually trigger a gamma-ray burst. One night, while on a routine experiment, Dr. K and Alan exposed the well to a remnant which triggered a massive gamma-ray burst that was many times more powerful than they had ever observed. This supposedly killed both of the researchers instantly, and the resulting electromagnetic wave caused all persons within a 10-mile radius to undergo 30 seconds of hallucinations. It also resulted in the surrounding area being irradiated, which caused a new set of artificial remnants to be created. These new remnants exhibited strange, otherworldly, SCP-like properties, such as a microwave now freezing things instead of heating them, or a can of paint now being able to produce any pigment in existence. These new remnants also produced a mental change in those who found them, causing an obsession with the object that always eventually ended with the person disappearing into the zone. Back to the events of the game, there hasn't been a record of a remnant sighting in multiple decades, but as it turns out, that car you found at the beginning of the game is a remnant. People might be wondering why I didn't feel the need to mention that the car is a remnant until right now. That's because the car's remnant status really only serves to drive the plot forward and has no effect on anything else. You're told that you need to unbind yourself from the remnant in order for you to leave, but the conclusion of that plot point is very unsatisfying. It also just occurred to me that I never explained who your guides are. Dr. Ophelia Turner, also known as Oppie, is the woman that invented Limtech, we already know her. The other two are Tobias Barlow, who was head of maintenance at ARDA, and Dr. Francis Cook, another researcher who was working to prove a theory that we'll be talking about in just a bit. These three disobeyed the order to evacuate the zone to continue their research for various reasons. Tobias and Oppie get you to bring your car into contact with another anomaly called Colossal Cappy in an attempt to confirm the car's remnant status. Doing this triggers a small-scale repeat of the mass hallucination event from 1961 and reveals that the electromagnetic waveform coming off of it is equal and opposite to the car's waveform. And they theorize that if you bring the car in contact with the well where the signal came from, it may cancel out the vehicle's remnant energy. It's not a great plan, but what other options do we have? This information is revealed to you about an hour or two into the game and getting to the well remains your goal for the rest of its runtime. Tobias and Francis review Francis' previous research at Arda, which was a theory that proposed that everything that happened in the zone left an imprint on the land. Not like a physical imprint, more like the land remembering what happened and then being able to reproduce that memory at a later date. This sounds complicated, so to put it in simpler terms, in the zone, when gamma ray bursts happen, you can talk to ghosts. The game puts it a bit more eloquently than that, but that's essentially what matters. Francis' theory is actually valid, but at the time that he was employed, he ran out of funding before he could prove it and forge results in an attempt to get more time. He was found out and demoted by Oppie, not fired, just demoted. Back to the present, Oppie sends us to check out a research facility in the mid-zone that was supposed to have been demolished. However, she finds access logs to the facility from Dr. K, who was supposed to have died from the gamma ray burst radiation, but didn't so that Oppie could find out that this facility is still here. 
we learn more details about the mass hallucination event and the nature of the remnants that I explained earlier. Now the player needs to get to the well, but it's in the deep zone which hasn't been accessed in years. The scheme we concoct for how we actually get through the old wall which guards it is convoluted and doesn't make a ton of sense, but here's the plan. The actual path to the entrance of the old wall is quite dangerous, but Oppie sends us a blueprint for a piece of tech called a limb shield which will provide our car with the defense it needs to get us through. The only problem is that the shield is too power hungry to get us through the entire way, which means we will need to recharge on the go, but the deep zone has no power anymore since nobody lives there, so Francis and Tobias offer to reroute some of the mid zone's power to the deep zone so that we can recharge a shield on the move as well as supply the power we need to even open the gate. This works, but Tobias sacrifices himself to get the power we need. Francis is understandably upset after Tobias dies, so Oppie finally decides to spill about why she's being so weird. She talks about how when working late one night, Alan visited in her lab and they had coffee and talked. Then the mass hallucination event happened and she couldn't locate him in the aftermath. Then she found out what we know now, that Alan had just died in the experiment at the well. Oppie wants to know if what she saw of Alan that night was a result of the mass hallucination, or if her experience proves Francis' theory right. Now we need to get to the well, but if you've been paying attention, you know that there is a problem. How do we stop the well from triggering another huge gamma ray burst when it makes contact with our car, our remnant? The lab notes we found in the mid-zone facility talk about a suppression technique that Alan developed. Oppie thinks she can replicate it. There are no other details given. I shouldn't need to tell you that that's bad writing. She also gives us an upgrade for the arc device that will let us open up a warp gate at the last minute so that the radiation doesn't kill us. The explanation for how that one works doesn't make much sense either, but at least they kinda tried with that one. So we go to the well, have a walking simulator moment where we hear from the ghosts of Tobias and Alan, which proves Francis's theory, have a short driving section, and beam back to the garage in a car without remnant energy. Oppie says she's leaving the zone, leaving the reins to Francis, and then the credits roll. Holy shit. So let's just get started, I guess. Uh, before I critique the story, I want to say that historically, I've had pretty poor comprehension of stories in video games, so odds are some of these things may have simple explanations that I just missed. Please feel free to correct me in the comments. So, obvious first thing, that ending? It's so strange that a game that had this strong a start seems so eager to have you be finished with it by the second half, and you not even escaping the zone, which is set up as your overall goal at the beginning, is kind of aggravating. Even without considering how the player character would feel, like I get that we've had some fun times with Oppie and the gang, but still, I think that all of us can agree that this place sucks, and if I don't have a strong reason to stay anymore, then I want out. Does Oppie not feel the need to repay you for all you've done? Apparently not, because she just dips out. She even says that she's leaving the zone, without so much as asking if maybe the driver would want to leave with her. She just acts like we've resolved ourselves to the life of a sci-fi Sisyphus driving around the zone for all eternity, or until I'm inevitably killed. And Francis is cool with this as well. I almost kind of feel bad for talking about this because I think that there's no way in hell that this is the ending that Ironwood had in mind for this game. This to me feels like the result of an outside force, like a release deadline or running out of funding or something. My next question that stuck out in my mind was that if during the night of the mass hallucination event, the gamma ray bursts hadn't happened yet, how was Oppie talking to Alan's ghost? This seems to go against how both the mass hallucination and Francis' theory works. Some people might bring up the visions, these are murals of what an ARDA employee saw during the mass hallucinations that ended up foretelling real things that ended up happening in the zone, but again, these were painted after the mass hallucination. Am I missing something here? It doesn't seem to make sense. Next, and I touched on this already, but Dr. K not dying during the mass hallucination event feels so clearly like it was a retcon made for allowing Oppie to discover that the research facility in the mid-zone was never destroyed. Tobias is clear that Dr. K should have died from the radiation, but offers no explanation to how he managed to survive. This is a pretty minor thing that I'm totally willing to forgive, but it does illuminate a singular flaw in an otherwise good design decision in the player character. A thing that I really like about Pacific Drive is that the person you play as is a complete non-character. They have no face, they have no voice, they have no physical form, or even shadow. They're always referred to as the driver, but that's the extent of their characterization. This is a great design choice in my opinion. It allows you to experience the events of Pacific Drive as if they were happening to you, and the game is all the more immersive for it. The only problem with this approach is that the player cannot easily communicate information with Tobias, Francis, and Oppie, and this bottlenecks how the story can be told a little bit. 
I think it could have been really cool if you, the player, were the one that discovered that this mid-zone facility was never demolished, but since you don't have the ability to communicate with your guides, it forces your guides to find this out themselves and send you there independent of their own actions. Also, I'm just saying that the fact that none of your guides once suggest the possibility of sending you a transmitter so that you can more effectively communicate is absurd. These people are scientists. Oppie developed fucking teleportation technology. She can't send you a microphone? Off the cuff of that, I want to say that I think that the characters in Pacific Driver are all pretty great. I don't have a ton to say about them, just that I think they're all likable in their own way and that their dialogue is well written. What I'm not as enthused with is the voice acting. Admittedly, I'm very picky and rarely impressed by voice acting, and the performances in Pacific Drive are certainly not bad, but the main issue is that one of them totally steals the show in my opinion, and that's Francis. Francis is voiced by Michael Turner, a man who doesn't have that many voiceover credits to his name, but goddamn can he act in this game. He sounds perfect for the role, with Francis being a quiet, shy, and overall unconfident yet extremely smart science person. I was blown away by his performance during the scene of Tobias' death. I mean, he really sells it. I it's too dangerous out there! Tobias! Please, Tobias, come back! Tobias, please, Tobias, please, come back! Ready? Please don't do this! Francis, it's now or never! I'm rewriting the grid now. I'll be waiting for you. Jeff Wong's performance as Tobias and Tara Langella's performance as Oppie weren't bad, but they ended up kind of sounding like caricatures next to Francis, who actually sounds like a real person to me. Again, that's just my opinion. I'm very picky about these things, and I admittedly don't know anything about the process of production in this area. Please don't come after me. It's about time to start wrapping up this video, which means it's time to talk about the game's biggest flaw, the fabricator and its progression. As previously mentioned, the tech tree is the most exciting part of the game for me. But continuing to engage with this system led me to the realization that this system is not balanced well at all with the actual content of the game. In a couple of ways. The simplest of these is that there is way too many upgrades in the Fabricator in comparison to how much story content there is. During my initial playthrough, I was kept so motivated by the prospect of getting to build and upgrade my car in the specific way that I wanted, and then I got to the deep zone and was finally able to get the anchor energy and resources I needed, only to realize that by the time that you get here, the game is about ready to be over. On top of still having to collect all of these resources I needed, I was only going to get to use this new technology for maybe one run before the credits rolled. Also, most of the stuff that you can unlock with the Fabricator is cool, but occasionally it throws something at you that is kinda useless. You can unlock up to five pneumatic lockers, which are storage bins that can store an infinite amount of items. Why would I ever need more than one of these? A similar thing happens with the car part lockers. These things make a little more sense if you want to try absolutely every car part available to you, but it still seems excessive. Another common sentiment I've heard a lot of people share about this game is the intense grinding that comes with unlocking and crafting some of the later upgrades. There's quite an intense curve in how resource intensive some of these final upgrades are. If you want to try to fill out the entirety of the tech tree, you're going to spend a lot of time doing multiple collection runs for a single item. On the topic of resources, a problem I ran into on my first go around was actually finding out where to find some of these resources. The game teaches you early on where and how to get stuff that may not be as obvious, like in the first mission when Oppie teaches you how to use an impact hammer to farm plasma, but the game does not continue this trend. Thermosap crystals, tree candy, explosives, the game expects you to figure out how to get these yourself, which would be okay if some of these didn't require a great deal of luck to find on accident. The most efficient way to collect thermosap crystals is to find these large red crystals in the mid zone. This is okay, but there's two issues. The first is that your introduction to the mid zone shows you these glowing red masses that you cannot harvest and give you no resources. On my first playthrough, these things conditioned me into thinking that any red masses in the mid zone were not worth investigating, and it took me googling how to efficiently farm thermosap crystals to learn about the giant versions of these crystals that you're supposed to use to get them. More than likely that example is my own fault, but let's take a look at the next resource, tree candy. Tree candy is also found in the mid zone, it spawns on these short tree stumps. I completely missed these my first go around, and I think a lot of other people probably would as well. All the biomes in the mid zone are filled with trees, and I think I can be forgiven for thinking that these things were just additional decoration at first. 
their design wouldn't give you any indication that there's a resource to be collected here until you examine them closely and get the prompt to use the vacuum. Again, it took me looking up how to get tree candy that I discovered these. Last example I'll give is explosives. These items were frustrating to me because the game unintentionally misled me as to how I was meant to get these. Every junction in Pacific Drive has wrecked cars scattered throughout the place. Most of these just look like regular everyday cars, but some of them are armored cars that I'm assuming previously belonged to Arda. Very rarely the trunks of these cars can contain explosives. With the knowledge that the primary item you would want that requires explosives, the limb-chipped engine, requires only 10 explosives, I assumed that the only way to get these items was to slowly collect the required amount over the course of the game. That may have been a bit of a leap in logic for me, but it didn't sound that unreasonable. However, I was, of course, wrong. The way that you're actually meant to collect explosives is by finding random-ass crates in the deep zone. These sound like they would be out of place enough to notice, but I never found these things on purpose. When re-watching footage for this video, I even noticed myself driving past them a couple of times. Again, it's possible that I'm just a blind idiot, so please let me know if you had the same problem I did here. I'm genuinely curious. So here's a scenario. You make your way to the deep zone and decided that you're gonna grind for all of the good upgrades for your car and now it looks like a spaceship. Gathering all those resources sure was tedious, but at least you get to breeze right through the end of the game now, right? The good news is, yeah, you'll be able to coast right through the end game. But the bad news is that you didn't actually need any of this shit to be able to fly right through the ending. And that's ultimately the worst thing about Pacific Drive that this whole process of turning this car from a turd on wheels to a turd on wheels with racing stripes on it is entirely self-serving. All upgrading this car seems to do is make the process of collecting more stuff easier, and it isn't until it's already over that you realize that taking the time to get that chrono stop emitter or those Olympium doors really was just kind of a waste of time. I mean, it's not entirely a waste, actually driving the car around is always entertaining, but still, it kind of kicks all your accomplishments to the curb. The hardest part of actually finishing this game is just the process of going through a few deep zone junctions to actually get to the final junction. But the thing is, you're probably going into this thinking, this is the final junction of the game, they're saving something intense for this, right? Surely. So you drive there very cautiously, avoiding anomalies, probably not even collecting anything, just focused on setting foot in the junction. And then you get there, and here's what you get. You go down a sleepy winding road and drive into a bright light. You're now teleported out of your car and are forced to walk down a completely harmless hallway of televisions while you listen to exposition. You get back in your car and you gotta get out of there, drive like hell to the warp while all hell breaks loose around you, there's anomalies everywhere, and oh, they can't actually kill you? or even really hurt you. You drive past them with a mild sense of urgency, and you're back at the garage, and you've just beaten the game. Ugh, it's probably about now that you think that I'm the biggest Pacific Drive hater that ever lived, but I want to sincerely express that I fucking love this game. It's one of my favorite games that I've ever played. It's so unique and fun, and so full of character, truly unlike anything I've ever played, and probably unlike anything I will ever play. I know that I just gave this game a ton of shit, but at the end of the day, I can't recommend this game enough. It's not going to be for everybody, but I think that those who will like it will be very glad that they played it. Ironwood, I've got my eyes on you. I'll be holding out hope for a DLC or maybe even an eventual sequel. But even if neither of those things ever happen, I'm just glad that the game that we have now exists, because I'll probably continue playing it for years to come. And just for the record, I'm not very good at ending videos either.